Praise the Lord. Uh, welcome you today to uh, Dandeway Bible Study. I am so happy uh, that you can make it today. Welcome to the Dandeway Bible Study. Today, we continue our study of the book of Genesis. And we are going to go on to chapter 4. Last week, we uh, concluded a study of chapter 3. And if we can make a quick uh, recap in Genesis chapter 3, uh, it dealt primarily with the fall of man, fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. That Adam and Eve were deceived by Satan, the serpent, and they fell. And God caused the serpent, God caused the ground for Adam's sake. God did not cause Adam, and God did not cause Eve. Uh, today, we now start Genesis chapter 4. Let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have granted us access uh, to your word. Uh, we know you and your word are one and the same. Lord, we pray that you will open our ears uh, to your word as we study today. That, Father Lord, it will not just be head knowledge, uh, but it will be heart knowledge. One that we are ready to obey. Father Lord, we pray that you bring victory and deliverance in our life today through your word. Uh, that your name alone will be glorified. Thank you for glorifying the name of our Lord Jesus Christ through our Bible study today. And we welcome the Holy Spirit being our teacher. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, uh, we start Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4 uh, primarily deals with, uh, you know, the main characters. The main characters of Genesis chapter 4 are Cain and Abel. But Genesis chapter 4 contains much more than just Cain and Abel. Actually, if we can do a general overview of Genesis chapter 4, we will find out that Genesis chapter 4, uh, doing an overview, uh, deals with the issue of marriage, deals with worship, uh, the effect of sin, sin coming in to the human race for the first time. We're seeing the effect here. It came in in chapter 3. We're seeing the effect in chapter 4. Man's ingenuity. The evil of polygamy was found documented in this chapter. And it also closed with worship. Now, we know that uh, it's amazing that uh, the first few chapters of Genesis are so packed with so much information. Actually, if we look again at this Genesis chapter 4, all the issues that I dealt with, uh, you can open a library <laughs> and call it Genesis chapter 4 because books can be written on, on marriage, on worship, effect of sin, man's ingenuity, uh, poly, evil of polygamy. There is so much that is packed. And Genesis is, and, and the Bible as a whole are inexhaustible. We're supposed to keep studying. And God will continue to reveal higher and higher levels of his truth to us in Jesus' name. So let's go ahead now to uh, read uh, this Genesis chapter 4. We'll be starting uh, with verses 1 to 8. And I'll be reading the New King James Version. Actually, I can pull it up on the screen. So if you want to follow. Okay, so let's start Genesis chapter 4 from verse 1. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again. This time, his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain 
brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass. When they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. So we are finding out about um, marriage in the first verse of the chapter, and uh, also the fact that uh, Eve conceived and bore Cain, thinking. This is it. This is the man. This is my seed that is going to uh, avenge and, and crush Satan. And uh, and going down, we're finding out about worship and uh, how sin now became manifest and Cain killed his brother Abel. But today, we are going to focus on Genesis chapter, I mean, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to focus on verse 1. And you will see as we go along that uh, there's just so much in this chapter. And I believe we are going to hang out here uh, for a while. So, uh, verse 1 states that now Adam knew his wife and conceived and bore Cain. So, let's stop right there. So, the chapter opens, as I mentioned, with marriage. Marriage is very important. In fact, when the Pharisees asked Jesus Christ question about marriage and divorce in Matthew chapter 19, uh, Jesus Christ referred them back to Genesis. There are three most important days in the human life, generally speaking, okay? The day of birth, <laughs> the day of death, and the day of marriage, okay? Uh, those three are the most critical because marriage is so important that it's of the same caliber as birth and death. In fact, we're going to look at this issue of marriage today, and we'll find out that marriage itself actually encompasses both ends of the spectrum. It encompasses new birth because a new relationship, a family is being created at marriage, and it also includes some element of death. Death to the... I, I will explain, uh, and as we go along, I pray that the Holy Spirit will uh, open our hearts and help us to understand uh, this issue of marriage. Marriage today is under attack, and I want to believe is by the devil, by the evil one. Uh, we are told that of all people that get married, 50% get divorced. 50%. That's, 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 that's too many. Okay? 50% of the general population. And actually, among Christians, they say it's actually higher <laughs> than 50%. We can look at it as, you know, like a glass filled of water and thank God that at least 50% survives. Or we can also look at it the other way around, which will still be valid, that we ought to take steps to make sure that we don't have 50% of marriages falling to this calamity of divorce. So let's read Genesis, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19, I will uh, uh, invite you to pull it up on your, in your Bible. Matthew 19, we'll be reading verses 3 to 6. Okay, reading verses 3 to 6 of 
Matthew 19. The Pharisees also came to him, came to Jesus Christ, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So, marriage is God's idea. In Genesis 2.18, we find God making the statement uh, about Adam that, and the Lord God said in Genesis 2.18, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And actually in this verse, uh, let's, let's, let's read the verse 24 to complete this. Okay, Therefore, which our Jesus Christ also quoted, quoted in the Matthew chapter 19 that I just read, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh in marriage. Okay? Now, God said it is not good for man to be alone. We remember that God is a spirit. Man was made in the image of God, meaning man is a spirit as well. God, who created man as a spirit, said it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper meet for him. In Hebrew language, it's actually saying, I will make him complete by creating the female counterpart. I will make Adam complete by giving him a help meet. You can uh, imagine a lock and a key that fits together, that makes complete. You cannot have two locks trying to combine, <laughs> as in homosexuality, what they're trying to do. It's not going to work. It's not God's design. Or you have two keys trying to lock it together. It has to be the lock that God designed and the key that fits perfectly. God said, I will make man complete. Let's bear that in mind as we go along in this study. Now, marriage is a commandment. As, as we read in Genesis 2.24 and also in uh, Matthew 19.6. Let's look at that again. Genesis 2.24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. God is saying, a man shall live. Okay? Shall live is a commandment. You can say in a way is a permissive commandment. Okay? Uh, because there are people, Jesus Christ said, it's not for all. It, marriage is not given to all. There are some that are born eunuchs that are going to stay single. But marriage by itself is a commandment. And I heard one of my pastors say before that when he does marriage counseling and asking people, why do you want to get married? That it's amazing how few the number of those that got it right. Majority of the people are going to say, we love each other. We fell in love. So we want to get married. We fell in love. That very few get it right that will say, well, we want to get married in obedience to God, in obedience to God's commandment. That should be the motivation of getting married because God commanded it and you want to do it as a man. Let me talk from a man's perspective so that the man will be complete. And if the man is complete, so is the woman. So let's go back to uh, uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Genesis 4 1. Here we uh, read that Adam 
knew his wife. Let's remember the completeness that I mentioned. The lock on one hand and the key that fits inside and makes complete. So, Adam knew his wife. This word knew is the same word that was used in the previous chapter after the scene that Adam and Eve knew that they were naked. Adam now knew his wife is the word Yoda. Yoda in Hebrew. It's difficult to translate from what I have found out that the word Yoda, if you actually look it up in the lexicon, you can tell that the, inter the translators actually struggled to, to interpret this word. So many words, so many other synonyms are used to reflect this word. Knowing, you know, you, sometimes you say you just know. I mean, even without being told of something, you just know. Uh, for example, the an example I can use, the uh, great trumpeter, Miles Davis, was being interviewed at a point, and the interviewer asked him, how do you learn <laughs> to play the trumpet as good as you do? Mr. Miles Davis looked at him and said, it's about getting that something. And the interviewer said, getting that something? What is that something? Uh, Mr. Miles said and said, uh, smiled and said, when you got it, <laughs> that's something, you know you got it. If you got it, you got it. If you ain't got it, you ain't got it. You just know something. Marriage was designed for both the man and the woman to get to know each other, to get to learn about this completeness. And apparently, it, it's supposed to take uh, a whole lifetime. Because when you look at um, uh, uh, other situations when there are sexual intimacy, okay, like in, in, in the case of uh, Shechem, uh, the Hivite, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 2. Let's read that real quick. Genesis 34, verse 2. Okay, Genesis 34. Verse 2, and I read, And when she came, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, great prince of the country, saw her. He took her and lay with her. Okay? Lay is the word that was used, not new. And also 2 Samuel 11, 4. 2 Samuel 11, verse 4. Talking about David and Bathsheba. Then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her. So, when there is sexual intimacy in the context of marriage, God uses the word new. The scriptures tells us new. When it happens outside of the context of marriage, it's just lay. Okay. Next point. Very, very important. And I will ask us to please pay attention. Now, Marriage is a covenant. What is a covenant? Okay, let's quickly read Malachi 2.14. That shows us clearly that marriage is a covenant. Malachi chapter 2 verse 14. Uh, the priests were arguing with God here about their obedience uh, let's go ahead and read Malachi 2 14. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacher treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Wife by covenant. Marriage is a covenant. What is a covenant? Covenant is the highest degree of a contract, a highest degree of an agreement. Uh, in the, it was practiced in the ancients, maybe not that much uh, this day, that when two people come together to cut a covenant, uh, there, there is bloodshed in the process. They kill an animal. They divide the animal in two, lay it on the ground, and, and both parties walk in between 
in the, uh, denoting to themselves, implying to themselves that if either party breaks this agreement, the punishment is death. So a covenant is one that is not supposed to be broken except by death. Marriage happens to be of that caliber. That's why I mentioned before three most important days in a person's life, the day of birth, <laughs> the day of death, and the day of marriage. It is that important. Let's uh, look at this issue further. Uh, because you will say that uh, so when when does a covenant take effect? Uh, and if you don't learn anything from today's message, please learn this one. When does a covenant take effect? A covenant in the Bible is also referred to as testament. Okay, and let's read Hebrews chapter nine. Verses 16 and 17. Hebrews 9, 16 and 17. We're going to open up in my Bible here. Hebrews chapter 9. Okay, you can go there too, if you will. So Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. For where there is a testament, there must also be of necessity let me start again for where there is a testament there must also of necessity be the death of the testator for a testament is in force after men are dead since it has no power at all while the testator lives like a will you know a testament is also a will a will is of no effect, you know, when you go to your attorney or accountant and draft this will, you're going to give the land to your son, you're going to give the house to your daughter, you're going to give the money in the bank account to your wife, and, and then you sign it and keep that paper in your, <laughs> in your safe. That will, that paper is of no effect at that point in time. The paper is good, it's going to be effective when the testator, the person who drafted the will, dies. Now, let's bring that over to marriage. When does the marriage covenant take effect? The marriage covenant is initiated when the bride and the groom says i do i always thought you know the covenant starts when the groom you know uh, uh, the, the man is a woman and say i love you i love you i love you i love you let's get married okay let's do it and they get to the altar and uh, the priest says do you accept this woman as your fully uh, lawfully wedded wife and do you accept this man as your lawfully wedded husband and both parties say i do it is just like the person that drafted the contract and signs it okay that agreement really does not take effect <laughs> until the couple dies to self and i would need to explain that when the couple dies to self i'm not saying die physically but die to self there is no longer i there is no i or me in a marriage relationship that i or me has to become we and it's so sad and amazing at the same time that not many wedded couples ever get to this point of saying i died to me i'm not thinking about me not just me and my commitment to my mother or commitment to you know uh, my father and having allegiance to my sisters 
rather than my wife. I have to die, put all of that beside behind me. As God said, you should leave your mother and father and cleave, cleave completely. Unfortunately, not many couples get there because it takes a long time <laughs> to get to that point. Actually, I heard from a godly woman who was much older than me, and she was just telling me that it takes a while for married couples. She was a Christian, married as a Christian. The husband was a Christian. She was telling me she was about age of 55 when she actually got to the point of dying to herself. And then she said their marriage actually took, it's like it just took off at that point. They've been married for over 30 years. <laughs> their children are already grown. And what happened was, according to her, she was in a bad accident. She was, she had several injuries, was, she had surgeries, was in an ICU for some weeks. And according to her, that through all the care that she received, through all the surgeries and being on the ventilator in the ICU, each time she opens her eyes, the husband was there. Each time she was conscious and can see around, the husband was there. Actually, at some point, she said, the light just went off, that this is one person I can always count on. This is, this is somebody, how can God give me an entire human being who will lay everything aside just to be committed to me? And at that point, when she came out of the hospital, she said she stopped thinking of herself. Most married couples don't ever get there. We're always thinking about me and blaming the couple, always thinking about the couple's faults rather than how we can uh, look at their strengths and work with them to make things work. We are always thinking, hmm, maybe I can find somebody better. Yeah, looks better, huh? cooks better, you know, have more money, more qualification. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can get a professor too. That is the way people think, and that is why we are having over 50% of marriages ending in divorce. Okay? We have to die to self. I mean, like, self no longer exists. There's no my bank account, no my car, no my house, no my this or my that. It is we. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will help us to understand that, not, not with our heads, but with our hearts. In Jesus' name. So, uh, let's go ahead. Um, I think that will con conclude that aspect of the marriage that we want to look at today. Now, the second part of this Genesis chapter 1. Uh, the second part, let's read the whole thing again. Now, Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Eve said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. That's uh, the original King James Version. Uh, thinking that here comes my seed, here comes the man that is going to crush the head of Satan, as we dealt with last week in Genesis 3.15, uh, that the seed, uh, my seed is here. But instead of <laughs> deliverance, uh, what Came brought was was murder, <laughs> okay. So uh, she was wrong. Uh, that Cain was not the seed. All right, the seed is Jesus Christ, who came almost four thousand years later, okay. And if you can quickly read uh, Job chapter nine verse ten, Job chapter nine verse ten. It tells us God's God's ways are higher than our ways. God God is 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 amazing. All right, uh, Job chapter nine verse ten. He does great things past finding out. Yes, wonders without number. God's ways are past finding out. Even when God tells us, gives us direct instructions, sometimes we still need to sit down there and stay by God. And keep listening to him, meditating on his word, uh, praying prayer and supplication and, and worship to find out exactly what does this mean? 
when God said your seed will crush the seed, it probably didn't register that seed only comes from the man. It has to be a man, a woman's seed, a virgin birth. And Cain wasn't <laughs> even close. Uh, as I mentioned, Jesus Christ is the seed. And he came later. Let's read again um, Isaiah 55 verse 9. Isaiah 55 verse 9. And we're going to conclude uh, with this verse. Isaiah 55 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Praise the Lord. Thank you for your attention today. Look forward to seeing you again next week as we continue our study of Genesis chapter 4. Thank you and God bless.